Welcome back, and we're moving into uh, our conversation this morning about a very important uh, awareness week that is coming up. It's 16 days of activism, and uh, this is, of course, about ending violence against women and girls, and this year's theme is Hear Me Too. We have with us on set Eleanor Morillo, who is the Program Officer for the National Women's Commission, and we have Tahira Usher, who is the Human Development Coordinator for the Women's Department. Good morning and welcome. Good morning, thank you. And thank you so much for being here. Yes. So let's step back and talk about the reason behind celebrating what is called the 16 Days of Activism. 16 Days of Activism is a global um, celebration and basically it's a period where we, we take stock of where we are in terms of ending gender-based violence. Um, it started from 1991, the International Global Outreach of Women, and from then Belize have been, has been using that period where we come together, organization, both government and non-governmental organization, and we come up with activities to galvanize actions to bring awareness to gender-based violence. And we, the whole um, mission is to end violence against women and girls. Now, we have a very serious situation in this country. And I think more and more, as we see the reports coming out, whether it is the horrendous crimes against our young children, or the brutal murders that take place within a domestic situation of our women. Mm -hmm. I think we have a reason to be very concerned. Mm -hmm. I have to ask from your standpoint, you know, uh, one, we need evidence. What, are there numbers or indicators that are showing the problem is getting bigger or uh, more serious? Mm -hmm. And what is it like to, to hear from uh, your end just the magnitude of the problem? Well, um, I think first that we have to acknowledge that we often only hear about these cases when it's the worst case scenario. Yeah. Um, and so usually when a woman winds up dead or a child winds up dead, um, we find out about these cases and ultimately um, it's too late um, for anything to happen. So I think that that would then skew the numbers because we don't have a lot of women and um, women coming forward and reporting that they're being in these situations and so the numbers would be underreported as well as again with children being affected by violence it's often the case that we come in very late or we know of these cases when things have gone to the extreme um, and so how is it that we get our public to be comfortable to come in to want to report these cases because then that um, there may be several reasons why they don't come in to report those cases. How do we get them to report the cases so that we have the actual numbers to signify yes. the extent of this problem in our country? Um, and then us responding and providing the, the measures to, to ensure that these people are secure and protected. There's a, there's a mental barrier. I feel like we're going from one mental barrier mm -hmm. to the other in this conversation. But you know, we, we need to hold up the mirror to ourselves sometimes. Mm -hmm. One of the things I find infuriating is when there is a murder of a woman in a domestic relationship or uh, something terrible that has happened uh, along those lines, and then you have family members and friends and who openly say that the woman has been a victim yes. of domestic violence yes. for years. I, now, I don't know if these people have come in contact mm -hmm. with the system before, but it almost gives the impression that the social acceptance of domestic violence, of gender-based violence, is still very common in this country. Mm, indeed. And it goes back to the, mm. um, the idea of gender-based violence or domestic violence specifically being very private mm, and yeah. intimate. And so even if your sister or your auntie knows that you're being um, violently abused, that they don't go out and speak out because it's it's seen as a family matter and it seems very private and for you to go out and you to say something it 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 comes off as being um you being disrespectful or you going against family values yeah, because it's, yes you're getting mm -hmm. into people's business and mm -hmm. so even when we do have the instance where somebody would report that a family member is being abused again because we're dealing with adults um, the authorities cannot go in until that person acknowledges and wants the authority yes. to go in, whether it's the police or, or our department or whichever entity. Um, so 
it goes back again on the issue of the privacy and, and, and us thinking that it's an intimate problem and it's not a public mm. problem unless then that the, the issue is, is brought up by that, that victim or that survivor of being in that violence. Mm. No, reporting is one thing, but prevention to me is where the money mm. is. Yes. Mm -hmm. What are the root causes of violence and how can we address those things, um, not only in the 16 days of activism, but just as a society on a whole? What are the root causes and how do we address them of violence? Yeah. So our National Gender-Based Violence Action Plan, um, it highlights primary prevention as one of our main priority areas to tackle gender-based violence in Belize. Um, and there are many causes we can go back to our, our deep-rooted cultural beliefs mm -hmm. that um, men are superior and they're supposed to be aggressive and these gender roles that we attach to the different different sex so males being very dominant them being aggressive women being submissive inferior mm -hmm. and it all goes back to that and that plays out in the household in terms of economics finances um who is responsible for the bulk of the ch child ki child rearing and and so those um power imbalances, they play out in the household and in the public because you have it in the, your workspace and all spheres of our life. Um, and so due to that in power balances, we see or we, that is translated into the way that men and women interact with each other. Yeah. And then... Yeah. And there is no one answer. I, I, like we were discussing earlier, you know, I was saying um, Around this time, we, we do so much advocacy and so much education, and women now have all this information, and the men may not like that. And then you said, what about economics? So there is more than one reason. We have all these factors um, that we have to work with in terms of why people become violent. Yeah. Why yeah. do we still don't talk about it? We know about it. I was looking on Facebook earlier with, about the case that happened last night, and people were, were giving comments everybody knew on both sides of the family, according to, to what they suicide. have. Yes, suicide they, they suicide, murder. That this one is saying, oh, but she, 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 she was in it for so long and she, she, she tried to stay for her children. So we know, we know that it's happening. People know that it's not right, but for the sake of family or, and whatever other factors, people remain in these abusive relationships. So I guess another strategy we have to come up with is how to, to shift the, the behavior change. Yeah. I wish, you know, this, this it breaks my heart when we yes. think about what some women are going mm -hmm. through. Yeah. And, I, and I know you want to defend men. And I, I'm not saying all men <laughs> are abusers. Exactly. But mm -hmm. predominantly, predominantly in these situations, mm -hmm. it is usually a male yeah. abusing mm -hmm. a woman. Yeah. Not that it can't happen the other mm -hmm. way around. Yes, of course. But I feel that sometimes what we miss in the conversation is pointing out to young girls and young women two things. One, the inner strength that we have, you know, well, it, and it's fostered from where children, mm -hmm. you know, you teach yeah. a little girl how strong she can yeah, be mm -hmm. when she's in a relationship with a man. Right. Because you show her with mother-father relationship exactly. and the messages you tell her. Exactly. But secondly, love is love, you know, and uh, there's love, there's commitment, there's financial mm -hmm. commitment mm -hmm. right. that keeps people in a situation. Mm -hmm. And they're usually very early signs Yes. that show yes. a jealous, possessive, mm -hmm. controlling uh, relationship from the start. Indeed. What worries me is that I think sometimes we're not teaching our young girls to spot it and put a brakes on it mm -hmm. when they can, mm -hmm. giving them the strength as well to mm -hmm. learn how to put that brakes. Like, no, you won't go through my phone mm -hmm. uh, if that's something I don't agree to mm -hmm. or question me in an irrational way about every behavior yeah, and interaction I have. have. Or tell me I can't mm -hmm. hang out with my friends mm -hmm. or I can't go to my family because I'm worried that there might be another man included in mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. yeah. How do we get that messaging? In prevention, I feel like this is really important. You know, where we can start mm -hmm. in empowering our young girls to realize that they set the boundaries in relationships and I'm not saying that, you know, they bring it on themselves, but we can start You're there. Right. Yeah. You're right. And, and I think it, mm -hmm. sorry, I think it goes back to um, in your history because you'd find that a lot of these cases with the woman, this is not their first interaction with abuse. 
they have been in households where there 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 has been abuse um in generational abuse whether the mom was being abused by the dad the grandmother was being abused by the grandfather and so it's something that has been embedded in their lives or present in their lives from from growing up from very young ages and so um when they get into their own relationships now these are things that they have witnessed and they have seen and they and have no and it's normal yeah. for them and so yeah. if if my boyfriend doesn't give me money tomorrow to go to buy something that i need for the baby it it's accepted and and we know that to be because that is what my father did to my mother and so it's it's very hard then to go in you now and change the mindset um and not only change the mindset to show them that there are alternatives um some women feel that they don't need to work because they wait until the man comes home and give them the money and they feel that that is okay they don't understand that economic empowerment is one of the tools that they can use to to empower themselves from out of these type of relationships and so how do we go in and now change that mindset that has been there for 20 20 plus years mm -hmm. um and get them to really understand that gender-based violence is wrong and it, they should not have to stay in these relationships. And the end consequences can be the loss of your, your life. life. Right. It, it does a bit of an injustice to the entire cause, though, mm -hmm. to only focus on the relationship between men and women in terms of violence. Because mm -hmm. when we talk about gender-based violence, we're talking about vulnerable inequities, as you spoke about. Mm -hmm. So we're only, not only talking about relationships between men and women. We're talking about relationship between women and children. I was going up the road with my wife um, the other day and we looked across at a grandmother taking care of maybe a two-year-old and the two-year-old did something. All we could see was the, mm. the hits and we thought that's, that's too young of a child to be hitting that mm, hard. Yeah, it just, right. just doesn't work. So it does, the, 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 the message really is, to my mind, I don't know if I'm right, talking about people who are vulnerable and these mm. inequities. Because it also, and I hope you to talk about those two groups, children who are the victims of violence, domestic violence mm -hmm. or other violence, mm -hmm. and also older persons mm -hmm. who take a lick too. We don't even think about them. Um, how do we, I want you to talk a little bit about those vulnerable groups and what we're doing about them. Work are being done in terms of reaching the vulnerable population in the action plan. It also speaks to um, persons living with HIV and AIDS, um, persons with disabilities, and, and the older persons. So we have the National Council on Aging, and they do have activities for their older persons, and gender-based violence is a part of their training that they do every year. So mm -hmm. when they do um, different training, for example, with the law, they would bring in an, an attorney and talk about the laws and so on. The topic of gender-based violence is usually a part of that. So we do, um, even on the National Gender-Based Violence Committee, we do have persons representing those organizations. So it's leave no one behind. We, we include everybody in, in the population, including men. Yeah, and while we so, were at Women's Department, we, um, the main, uh, our main target group are women in domestic violence situation. We yeah. do sit on other committees such as the HIV committee, um, HIV and AIDS committee, elderly persons committee, and so we do reach those um, target population of vulnerable, vulnerable persons. And so through those committees, we're able to set up sessions and workshops to, to educate elder, older persons because they might be forgotten um, we have a lot of abuse of elderly yeah. persons, and so through those committees, we're able to reach those target areas. Can yeah. I just say, and mm -hmm. I gotta bring it back because mm -hmm. Kev, as much as you want to broaden it, there is a problem, and I'll quote you the numbers from our own statistics: mm -hmm. six out of ten women globally will experience physical violence. Mm -hmm. Six out of ten. Mm -hmm. We will also see. I, I believe specifically, it is one of the largest human rights violations Relation. that takes place across the globe. Mm -hmm. And Belize is not indifferent to it. It's not that it doesn't happen to men. Mm -hmm. It's not that they are left behind in this issue, but it is predominantly mm -hmm. done to women. Mm -hmm. And we need to be, just like we have to have the open talk about HIV, mm -hmm. we need to have the open, open talk, talk about why our women are so vulnerable mm -hmm. to mental, physical, and sexual mm -hmm. abuse. What are we finding in evidence, in data? What type of research is being done 
at home, for us to get our own, I mean, we know the, the social constructs in India or the Middle East are different, but what do we know about the social constructs in Belize, why we still see little girls as young as two years old getting raped, and women who have children witness their own murders by their spouses, their, the person they love. What do we know? Well, I know a study was conducted, I believe, two years ago, 2016, um, and it focused specifically on Stan Creek and Corozal. And there were two, it's two different dynamics in those different districts. Um, and it, it revealed that one out of three women in Belize would face uh, gender-based violence, domestic violence. And from that study, they had asked the respondents to outright say if they were in abusive relationships. And we had a few numbers and a few people come out. But when they were asked to write it, write it down unanimously on a piece of paper, whether or not they had faced gender-based violence, it revealed that it was much more than the persons that actually got up and said Same. something. Mm -hmm. um, and so that just reveals to us that people are scared. They don't want to come out and they don't want to report. Mm -hmm. And so again, it goes back that it skews our number and it, it, it's showing us, it's not showing us the reality of this, um, the social problem in, in, our, in our community. And talking about the, the social problems and not seeing them, um, Violence is violence. Mm -hmm. We are a violent society. When you look at Belize City and the numbers in terms of, even in terms of male on male violence, to death, to murders, it's tremendous. We're not even counting the fights and the stabs mm -hmm. between men and men, much less men and women. So it is a pervasive problem. But, and to go further in Marlene's question, which is, to me there are three issues. One, self-esteem. Mm -hmm. Two, economics and three, conflict resolution. How are we dealing with those things, which to me feed directly into how violent we are to each other? Mm -hmm. um, again, I, I think that with all the agencies come together, they focus on different target areas. So you'd find that like Restore Belize and CYDP, they deal with gang resistance and they deal with our young men and our males that are involved in um, that aspect of violence, and it's gang violence or male-to-male -male violence. And then you'd have women's department who would focus on more domestic violence um, yeah. relationship issues. Mm -hmm. And so we focus on our, our victims, whether it is female or male, because we do open up our doors to male victims. And we have had male victims come and report. Mm -hmm. While it's not the, the larger of the two, we have had males come in. Mm -hmm. um, and so we do a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching and self-esteem with our clients. Um, as well as um, life skills sessions with students and within that life skills sessions we have a, a gender manual which focuses on conflict resolution providing alternatives to, to persons instead of um, resulting to violence and conflict how they could positively um, positively come or come to an agreement without having to use force or violence and so I think that those things um, they're good because they target our younger population, yeah. so they grow up with those tools. How are we doing with reporting? Are we seeing more women make the brave step to leave domestic violent relationships? I would say no. No. Um, I would say no, and mm -hmm. it's across all districts. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. we're not seeing women coming. I mean. We do get instance where family members or the community would come and report, but when we go in, and it's very sensitive because now to send an officer into a household where they have not acknowledged that there's violence and, and the woman is not ready to come out, it's very dangerous. For them. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. very dangerous yeah. for the yeah. officers. And so um, it causes conflict, and we have to then determine or find unique and creative ways. How do we reach these women? To just give them a little bit of information on their rights, what they need to know about. Because it, it might be the case that they don't even know what their rights are. And from your experience, for those who do take the brave step, because I think I really think people don't understand how hard it how is hard to it is. Mm -hmm. yes. a domestic violence situation. And in fact, there's a cycle. You know, course, sometimes you yeah. do go back, you do mm -hmm. go back, and then eventually there's just one, like a bird Big flying breaking. for the mm -hmm. first time. You, you remember that one time he was mm -hmm. good to you yeah. or she was good to you, and okay, we can try again. From those who do take the step to leave, what have they communicated to you to be the biggest barrier? Why are women 
staying in a situation where every day their life is it? Right. I would say financial. Yeah. I think that that is the underlining um, reasons that they usually give, especially when they have children. Yeah. It's much, I wouldn't say much easier, but um, for them to make that move when it's only them and they're a single they're single, it's easier than when you have five children or six children. Because again, it goes back to that trust that they build um, with the authorities. Um, do they trust us enough to, to believe that we will provide for them and we would, we would give them that safe home and they have their meals? And so again, it goes back to the trust that we have to build with our public. And um, the financial again, it's 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 yeah. a main reason. Mm -hmm. But when you say financial, though, it's not that it is only poor families where no. women are being abused. No. In fact, domestic violence is cut no across boundaries. the wealthiest of wealthiest, of to the poorest yes. of poorest. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes, yes, of course. Yeah. yeah. And so maybe um, even in the wealthiest of the wealthiest, I mean, if you are already used to a certain lifestyle, mm -hmm. you may not. You know, if I'm used to buying. Um, fifty dollars lunch every day, mm -hmm. and spend two hundred dollars on a bag. And now, if I leave, I may not be able to do that. So, um, yes, it, it there is no boundaries in terms of who it affects. It affects across all lines. We have made some progress as a country. Oh, yeah. Um, under the Domestic Violence Act, I know there's actually a provision that allows for the magistrate to now order that a couple who come to make a complaint be referred to counselling, which is a tremendous step forward. Mm -hmm. But what other mechanisms are there um, for persons who do decide to make the brave step to leave? How, much, how many safety nets? And have we developed our safety nets? The safe houses. Um, and we, we, have a, we, we have a program to deal with persons who are poor, who need a transition to get um, to the boost program and that, that sort of thing, and pantry. But we don't have one to assist persons to get out of these situations. You would think that there would be some sort of policy to say, OK, well, we can't assist you completely, but here is a starter pack, mm -hmm. a whole over for two weeks so you can think it over, not only a place to stay, you have four children, we can assist you that way. How is our safety net in um, terms of assisting people to leave? Well, um, I would say that we do have safety nets um, providing by the women's department. Uh, we treat any case of domestic violence as being urgent. Um, and so we immediately ask women, do you want to relocate? And it would then follow the question that, oh, I don't have any family members. I don't have any money. Where will I go? Or we, I have to hide from here. I have to hide. Mm -hmm. um, and so we would tell them that is not a problem. We just want you to tell us that you want to leave and we'll take you out. We'll take you and your children out. But then again, that goes long term um right. you thinking mm -hmm. oh my gosh what happens when the department is no longer there yeah. um and so what happens is that we take these um these clients and their family as we case manage and we provide a whole range of services to them whether it's relocation and paying rent so rent assistance food assistance and in, in the interim we have other programs as our economic empowerment program which we automatically enroll them into for them to, to secure some type yeah. of income. Because after the department leaves or after we have seen that you're stable and you're able to provide for your family and you're getting the, the health in terms of your um, psychosocial support and, and you're mentally stable, um, we, we would want it to be that you're able to provide for your family mm -hmm. after. Um, and so we provide a whole range of services. Um, it might not be perfect, we understand that there will be flaws in our system, um, but we treat every case of domestic violence as being urgent, whether it is that he's yelling at you, he's calling you names, or she, because I don't mm. want to um, discriminate, um, discriminate yes. yes. Um, <laughs> to, to, the, to the worst case scenario, you being hospitalized, and so we treat all those cases with the same severity. How many safe houses do we have in the country for domestic violence victims? Um, we have a safe house in Belize City, one. Mm -hmm. We have a safe house in Corozal, and we have one in Cayo. Mm -hmm. So there is none in the southern areas. Mm -hmm. So we would have to transfer those clients to either one of those safe homes. Do we have enough to meet the needs? Yes, I would say we do because we don't have, a, again, we don't have the, the numbers coming in to go to these safe shelters. So you would find that maybe some period there's nobody at the safe shelter. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so what happens to somebody who lives down south and needs a safe house? We would bring them into one of those safe homes. So we don't have community band where we can say we can identify community members. Yes. I would open my house up to somebody. That was to one of our, um, so this summer that was one of our tasks to go into these communities and find um, gender advocates mm -hmm. who would provide warm food. Because when we go into those rural areas, you would find that the police substations are very far yeah. from mm -hmm. the communities and so you as a woman and with children having to walk out in these dark areas at the night time it's unsafe and so we wanted to find in those communities people who are willing to open their doors mm -hmm. um, provide hot meals shelter until the, uh, the relevant authorities are able to step in the next yeah. morning whether it's a work day or it's during the weekend um, again, it goes back to the, the sensitivity of the issue, domestic violence, gender-based violence, and people um, viewing it as a private issue, and you might not get the buy-in that you would want, yeah. um, because people are scared as well. Um, we know that these situations can turn very violent, and you can be turned on as the person who is helping. Yeah. Um, and so how like is both. it? Mm -hmm. by both the well, abused yeah, and the abused. Yeah. Exactly. And so how is it that we get our community and our public to view this as all of our problem and all of our issue so that they can lend that support? Because we, we can't do it by ourselves and we need the support of the public. It seems that every time we have the 16 days of activism, there's always one of these sensational cases that come about. Mm -hmm. um, and it is such an important time for people to hear the messaging mm -hmm. you know um, for women to hear the messaging and, and know that they have to get themselves out and that we have a responsibility to our young girls to teach them that they do not have to be in unhealthy relationships from the overly controlling and possessive to the one who will potentially kill you mm -hmm. um, what are the activities that are planned for 16 for the 16 days yeah. of activism that you feel will help to target uh, the, mi the change of the mindset and also the empowerment of those who need to get out? Um, well, across the country, as you know, we have activities going on from in all six districts. We have self-esteem workshop, as you all have been yeah. saying, very important for young girls and even our women, you know, to build up their self-esteem and, and to be in healthy relationships. I know that even the curriculum, the education curriculum, the HFLE, talks about healthy and unhealthy relationships in HFLE and life skills at the primary and secondary level. Mm -hmm. But we, we, we have um, so many things happening across the board. The, um, this Sunday, we are for the opening, for the 25th, the beginning of 16 days, we're having a church service, we thought. Mm -hmm. It was so important. This, there is also a spiritual component to us as human beings. And so we have involved the churches and asked them to, to celebrate with us, to open and talk about um, gender-based violence as well in, in their church services. Um, their congregants may never be people who would attend a forum or invited to a workshop and so on. And they too may, um, you know, be in violent situations. We have the self-defense. Um, tomorrow is the, the launch, yeah. the launch of the, of the 16 days of activism at IT Vet, and we're inviting everybody to come out. At mm -hmm. the launch, we usually have one or two persons who are survivors of um, domestic violence speak. Mm -hmm. This year, a gentleman walked into our office and he said he wants to be a part of 16 Days. Love he it. is the father of a young woman who was killed about a month ago. Yeah. And he said, I want to speak because nobody talked to us and as a community, as their community. Mm -hmm. And so we said, sir, we will work with you. We are thankful that you, you know, were brave enough ah. to come in and and so he is going to be one of the speakers at the, um, at the land. So we have really come together as a committee this year and said we want to work together. We want to involve everybody. Um, usually we have a lot of activities just for females. This year we are focusing on the males. Mm -hmm. um, we want to hear from them in terms of masculinity. Why do they think the way they think? Why do they do the things they do? And how can we merge a partnership where men too can stand up and say, I say no to gender-based yeah. violence? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, as a committee this year, we really looked at our plan of action and we really say we want to involve as many stakeholders as possible this year. So from primary school, secondary school, the tertiary institutions, we're having gender-based violence sessions, forums, um, and, the and so on. And then workshops. the self-defense yeah. and so involving males and females. So we're trying to get the churches as much as possible to try to reach a wider How do people find range. out what's happening in their area? Well, our um, Facebook and our 
um, websites, National Women's Commission BZ.org, have, have the, that um, document there of activities. Okay. And it's from, it's in, it has from what's happening in each district on each day. And, and people are free to attend these sessions. We are not charging for anything in any of these gender-based violence sessions, mm -hmm. forums, and, and so on. My final question. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like the idea of perspectives. I'm so sure you are you appear um, on the the younger side yeah. of of the equation, um, and perspective helps in these situations because speaking from a perspective of a man, speaking from the perspective mm -hmm. of a victim, mm -hmm. speaking from the perspective of an ex um, abuser, speaking from the perspective of somebody who is in a vulnerable community like the LGBTI mm -hmm. community and violence, mm -hmm. so for there. Mm -hmm. um, Speaking from different perspectives assists, even if from a different culture, because mm -hmm. we have there's a cultural element to this too. Yeah. Yeah. Because we have we have a Mayan community, we have a Garifuna community, we have a Mennonite community, and we have multiple mixed and we, ha and we have mixed. multiple mixed communities. Right. So mm -hmm. it does add urban rural urban rural yeah. and yeah. as in, but being part of sixteen of activism in the past, I know that we've had. Um, contributions from everybody, even artists and poets. I can mm -hmm. remember mm -hmm. one year it was at the House of Culture, it was very powerful. What innovative ways this year are we using these 16 days to reach the next generation hmm. of young people mm -hmm. to try to stem this? Because some people are already stuck in their ways. Mm -hmm. Some of them need to get jailed and flagged, right. cat and nine tails. But there are a young group of a gen generation coming up who can actually start to say no and to stand this thing one time? What are we doing innovative-wise to get to that group? Well, I'm happy to report that the police um, department, actually, mm -hmm. they have a drama group, um, and they're doing countrywide tours yes. yeah. um, with this drama group. So they'll be going to primary schools um, and, secondary. To, and secondary schools to depict true drama, music, dance, acting, um, a message in terms of gender-based violence and, and how it is that the police interact um, and some of the laws and some of the legislations and so they would do that in a very um, creative way that would catch the attention of children mm -hmm. um, and as well as our universities, Galen University, UA, they, are al they also sit on the national committee and they too have pledged and committed to doing activities with the younger generation in primary schools to go out and do sessions because it might the, the, the message might be delivered differently through a younger person mm -hmm. than if one of us from Absolutely. the department would go in and, and give that message. And so I think that that is something good. Um, and we're reaching this generation with things that they're, um, they like and that is applicable to them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What would be your final message um, as we head into this, active, this period of activism? We, we do have a problem in this country mm -hmm. with victim blaming. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think sometimes it's because people don't want to face the reality of what we have happening in the country. What would be your advice to the general public about playing our parts in trying to whether help guide a young man away from violent behavior or to empower a young woman to leave a situation before it becomes too late? Mm -hmm. um, well, for me, I think our beautiful Belize, um, you know, we all have all these fancy plans and, and they sound so heavenly that we have a Belize free of violence where man, woman, um, boy and girl can live and reach their full potential. That's the motto of the gender policy. And mm -hmm. so that song so beautiful. But we need everybody to, I think it begins from back to the basic where we love and respect one another and it has to start in the home because it begins there and then it spreads out into the wider community, into the workplaces, in everywhere we go. And so we need to go back to the basic, respect manners, you know, teaching our children to say good morning and good afternoon. Please excuse me. Mm -hmm. Instead of pushing through adults talking, excuse me. You know, we need to go back to the basics. We need to love one another, respect one another, so that we, we and we be, we'll be less violent, we'll be less angry if we learn to smile and, and appreciate each other as human beings. Mm -hmm. So I think it begins from there. I would want for us to have honest discussions um, about gender-based violence in our country. I think that we tend to stray a lot about our reality and what is happening on the ground. Um, 
we tend to get uncomfortable to speak of the relationship with men and women um, and do the, the sex that has the upper hand, the power and the control. And honestly, I think that it's time for us to face a reality. Um, both of us, men and women, sitting at the same table because often the table is only filled with women mm -hmm. right. discussing this issue when um, men play a role as well in all forms of gender-based violence. And we continue to have these workshops, we continue to have these sessions, and no man shows up. Um, we need to really sit down and be honest and, and determine what what is the reason for this and how do we move forward to include them in our plan um, because we continue to say we'll include them and and they don't show up and so where does that leave us so i yeah. honestly hope that um from these activities that we have focused on engaging men whether it be domestic violence or men on men violence whatever it is that we or could sexual, sexual harassment, harassment, harassment that we could really get some commit if it's 10 men for the entire country um committed to be a part of this fight um 10 is more than enough right now we need because we have none um and so honestly i think that that what is what i hope for from out of these 16 days of activities all right well thank you and once again tomorrow okay. is the official launch at the sure it launch. vet uh, if anybody wants to participate and you can get your 16 days of activism calendar and find out which event you would like to attend as well uh thank you for coming in and best thank of you. luck thank we're gonna you. go ahead and take a break and we'll be back in a few so stay tuned